As soon as gatherer hunters began to have seasonal base camps, it was easily noticed that discarded seeds soon grew into edible plants, so a portion of food was obtained from planting and harvesting. About 500 generations, or 10,000 years ago, in Mesopotamia of ancient Iraq, a decreasing climate forced us to switch to full-time farming. By chance, this turned out to be the key to abundance that allowed our population to increase 100-fold. A room filled to the top with wheat, rice, or maize feeds thousands of people for months. This food surplus enabled and required civilization. We then had to invent political structures to organize numbers of persons greater than our innate band of a few extended families. From the beginning, the purpose of government has been to organize our mutual efforts. Throughout the next several thousand years, a changing climate forced the people in one world region after another to switch to full-time farming. Farming spread throughout the planet at the very slow pace of 10 miles or 16 kilometers per generation. Nobody ever sat amidst plenty of gatherable and huntable food and planned to become a full-time farmer. We were always forced to do so because of a decrease in climate and a population level that exceeded the carrying capacity of the land. The climate force shift to full-time farming happened first for those of us humans who lived in the foothills of Mesopotamia. This is the region of ancient Iraq lying between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Within a few generations, this further farming experience allowed us Mesopotamians to move on to the still rainy plains near the foothills to become full-time farmers along numerous little streams. This burst of farming activity resulted in an increased population who were living in hundreds of small independent villages. Within a few centuries, the continued drying of the climate caused the number of waterways of the plains to shrink to just the few largest rivers forcing the people of small villages to combine into fewer and more populous cities along the remaining waterways. These were humanity's first cities. Those of us human beings who lived in the first cities within Mesopotamia began to develop most every aspect of our current civilization. Our large cities today are not all that different from the original Mesopotamian cities. In ancient Mesopotamia, writing was done on small clay tablets. Archaeologists find fragments of tablets and their sentences, or sometimes caches of entire documents. For example, one tablet says that, This year a particular person managed 1,000 sheep for the king and was paid 50 lambs. Another tablet says that, The leader asked the council for approval on the matter. The first sentence tells us that there was a king and that herders were hired and paid in animals. The last sentence tells us that there were both leaders and councils and that the leader had to get approval from the council. Imagine if a description of your way of life was written down in thousands of individual sentences, for example, vote green, that were then separated and buried in thousands of locations to be recovered later by other persons who would then attempt to reconstruct your way of life. Generations of historians and archaeologists have spent their entire lifetime studying millions of individual facts and have pieced together the larger picture of the history of the ancient world. These facts were obtained from excavations of thousands of sites containing millions of artifacts, including hundreds of thousands of tablets that contain written notes describing people, culture and history, one sentence at a time. The seasonal harvest must be stored to provide year-round food. The first storage technique of the earliest stationary settlements was to dig pits into the ground and line them with clay. 
The clay was meant to keep rodents and insects away from the food. The clay lining was soon improved by fire hardening and evolved into fired clay vessels, or pottery, by 10,000 years ago. For the last 10,000 years, there has been an evolving pottery technology. Since we decorate everything, an early advance was to place the pot on a rotating table so that the painter wouldn't have to rotate. This soon led to the spinning potter's wheel. Since the properties of pottery depend on the temperature at which the clay is baked, changes continue to occur through the centuries as increasingly higher oven temperatures were obtained. This creates differing qualities of final products. For example, earthenware is made with very low firing temperatures. In recent centuries, pottery techniques had been kept as national secrets. For example, Medieval Chinese pottery makers were able to obtain the world's highest temperatures and create what Europeans called China. Endless varieties of pottery can be made that differ in size, shape, color, decoration, and in the mixture of earthen materials used in the clay. Pottery fashions are very local and rapidly go through short-lived generations. Archaeologists date a site from its pottery styles. Pottery is easily broken, but the resulting fragments, called pottery shards, are nearly indestructible and leave valuable clues for archaeologists. There are hundreds of volumes describing the time sequences of pottery styles for each region of the world. The first farmers and herders had to learn by trial and error which plants and animals could be domesticated. They also learned of the necessary procedures of crop rotation, when to plant, and in which type of soil, and how much seed should be kept for the next year. News of a successfully domesticated plant or animal spread quickly. For example, goats are wild in Iraq but were soon found in Syria and Palestine where they were not wild and amber wheat from Syria was taken to Iraq. Of the 4,000 species of mammals on the planet, only about a dozen have proven to be domesticatable. Surprisingly, no new species of plant or animal has been domesticated since our earliest efforts. We have inherited the knowledge of our earliest farming and herding ancestors. Whenever someone on the planet learns something, it is soon known by everyone else and never forgotten. Still today, wheat, rice, and maize account for two-thirds of our food supply. Domesticated plant and animal species are changed within a few generations. Wild sheep have a mixture of long hair and shorter wool hair. The earliest sheep raisers found that the shorter wool hair was useful and chose to increase the number of animals having more of that type. A new breed of dog is developed in 50 years or a dozen generations. Farmers sustain mutant plant species having unnatural traits that would not last on their own. Wild barley naturally propagates itself by releasing seeds blown loose by the wind. The first farmers help to propagate the naturally less fit variety of barley that doesn't fall apart in the wind and so is less able to scatter across the world and propagate itself. Farmers prefer that type. Where is wheat grown today? Where are sheep raised today? Where is maize grown today? Trade is evident as the movement of obsidian and metals and such away from their geographic origins, each of which have distinct chemical fingerprints enabling historians to track their dispersal. Materials are moved from where they naturally occur to places where they do not occur. Throughout the previous 25,000 years, Mesopotamia had already been obtaining such materials through trade with distant regions, including Egypt, Anatolia, and Africa. The lines show ancient trade routes. As Mesopotamian cities grew, they required huge amounts of imported materials. 
and this caused kingdoms to develop in those source locations. Food could not be transported for long distances because those traders would have had to eat their entire cargo before reaching their destination. Even in the late Roman Empire, the price of a wagon load of wheat doubled every 75 kilometers or 45 miles. Food could not be transported for the long distance of 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers until about the year 1900 A.D. Through the years 9000 to 6000 B.C., the Mesopotamians were living in sedentary villages practicing part-time farming while still gathering and hunting. This 3,000 year span of time is also about 150 generations. Each village contained only a small number of families. Each family lived in a small mud hut containing a single room. Since the surrounding land is vacant, a family can freely choose its plot. And just as the canela do, an entire village can easily move every few generations as land becomes worn. The first permanent villages occurred around 5500 BC and contain 300 persons. Population levels remain steady. By 5000 BC, irrigation canals were used to bring water to crop fields and this results in a crop surplus. Irrigation turned out to be the key to abundance. A single storage room filled to the top with grain can feed thousands of persons for months. The construction and maintenance of irrigation and storage systems requires mutual efforts and the management system that is a chiefdom and then state. The number of canals increased until they crisscrossed much of Mesopotamia. These are the canals near the city of Uma. For 1500 years these farmers lived in abundance and stability and their population grew. An irrigated plain has many small villages. A village moves to the top of a forming hierarchy because of its location or size. Soon, the top villages of a larger region form a multi-tiered hierarchy. This is the more complex political unit of the first chiefdom, and it has a centralized redistribution center controlled by a single ruler. The farming villages of the Mesopotamian foothills region now formed rank societies with privileged positions and leaders. Villages grew into city-sized urban centers containing 3,000 persons by 3500 BC. The first urban area classifiable as a city may have been Uruk. The people of the first cities had to invent the urban ways that are still very much the same in any city anywhere around the world today. Brand new occupations occur, including craftspersons, carpenters, and shopkeepers. City dwellers soon learned to locate living areas away from craft and manufacturing areas. The people of the first cities were also the first to encounter disease caused by large populations around waste and decaying food. Until 100 years ago, many cities let freely roaming pigs control the trash problem. In 3000 BC, Mesopotamia was still the only region in the world to have cities. There were no cities in Egypt, India, China, America, or Africa. Mesopotamia was the only civilized area of the world and so exported the idea of civilization to the surrounding areas. The strange sight of a city would have gather hunters spreading rumors from one band to the next all the way across the continent. By 2800 BC, small villages occur along the equator from the Indus to the Aegean. But Mesopotamian chiefdoms have become states with monumental architecture, state religions, and labor taxes. There were several independent city-sized states between the Persian Gulf and modern-day Baghdad. Cities grew in population and area by expanding their irrigation system to increase cropland. Many tablets record the promise of leaders to expand the irrigation works. These states had populations of 30,000 persons by 2700 BC and 300,000 persons by 2000 BC. In 
Each city is necessarily fed from crops grown in its surrounding area, which typically extends 15 kilometers or 10 miles. As neighboring cities grew outward in size, their surrounding areas began to overlap, producing arguments about bordering farmlands, water, and canals. Cities began arbitrating between the arguments of other pairs of cities in short-lived political unions. Such squabbles were recorded in the tablets for several generations before any intercity argument had brewed into a major fight. The first artistic depiction of warfare occurred around 3200 BC, but it was not a common theme until 2500 BC. While holding a bureaucratic position in an early cooperative around 2300 BC, Sargon of Agati got the idea that an empire could be created. Sargon was the first of us humans to think of forcibly uniting the cities of a region. Having no empathy for other human beings, Sargon sought benefits for himself by directing the cruel murder of thousands of other persons by chopping off arms, legs, and heads, such is the character of every would-be conqueror throughout history. Before Sargon, it had not occurred to a person to conquer neighboring cities to extract payments or attempt to be emperor of the world. Such wars of mass murder had never before occurred in the history of our species, which had been unaware of the destructive power that could be harnessed from thousands of people directed by one psychopath. Such leaders have ordered the salting of farmlands or the diversion of a river to destroy a city and kill its people. Normal human beings don't think this way. Only emperors commit mass murder for personal gain. They are not the heroes of history. It took some 5,000 years, which is the first half of human civilization, for Mesopotamian farming villages to grow to population levels of a few hundred thousand persons. These farming villages lived in peace for 5,000 years. No war occurred throughout this time period. War is not in human nature, and it is not a permanent part of civilization. Our first ever emperor somehow convinced his people that it will be glorious to go to another city and kill hundreds and even thousands of persons. Imagine what would have been your reaction to the news of the first ever massacre of thousands of persons. It is no coincidence that this is the time in which religion becomes moral instruction. Our most important spiritual leaders, including Moses, Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad, emerged soon after the development of large, stranger-filled cities, empires, and wars of mass murder. Our moral leaders re-emphasized our love for each other and our golden social rule. After the first emperor existed, many other kings said, What? You can do that? I want to have an empire just like him, only bigger. War was invented to create empires. A few generations after the first empire wars, People had already come to assume that war has always occurred, but actually, war has existed only through the second half of civilization, and war has always been the idea of our leader seeking to expand his own wealth and power for his own benefit at the cost of terrible deaths for other people by tearing away arms, legs, and heads. In each region of the world, Empires grew in size and duration up through the last century. Once you've seen one pattern of sloshing kingdoms and empires, you've seen them all. The so-called winning army was simply the largest army. The purpose of government, ever since the first chiefdoms, has always been to organize our mutual efforts. Together, and with such leadership, we accomplish civilization. But the newly invented emperor demanded that we kill and be killed so that he can expand his empire. Brunowski and Maslisch point out that a person will not come to your home and say, I must kill you for your food to feed my children. 
We all agree that this person's lack of food is no excuse for such immoral behavior. But some kings believe that morality does not apply to them and will kill to obtain territory, raw materials, or any other object of interest. For the last 5,000 years, we have let rulers answer to no one while causing much death. We, the human beings of the world, now tell our leaders that we will conduct no more war. Our nature is to be loving and nurturing parents, not mortal combatants as a favor for kings. Love and children, not empires, stir our being. We, the human beings of the world, don't care about being emperor. That does not stir our emotions, but children do. War is not innate human behavior, but love is. We love our children. They drive our very existence. We will do anything just to see them smile. We devote every effort of our lives to the well-being and nurtured growth of our children. We see that we are not yet fully in control of our political leaders when they continue their 5,000-year-old habit of going to war on a whim as they hope to expand their own wealth and power through the terrible death of other people. Family members might have their limbs blown off while eating at the dinner table. In the last century, war kills more civilians than combatants. For example, in just the first Gulf War, several hundred thousand human beings were killed. Most were civilians, of which half are children. The next time your leader promotes war and mass murder, simply say no because it means the murder of thousands of children. Some political leaders seek power through war and do not care that it means the death of 100,000 people. Do you know how to end war today? Fill the television with images of people screaming and crying because their arms have been blown off and their child's legs have been severed. Do you know how to keep a war going once it has started? Keep these images off the television. The price of such a terrible lie is a terrible death for innocent people. War and its injustice will occur only for as long as we let our leaders demand it, and only for as long as we go along with them. For too long we've been letting leaders cause murder. We, the human beings of the world, now agree that the nations of the world must immediately capture and imprison any leader who causes an attack on people in his region or in any other region. 
There's no reason for us to conduct war with that leader's military. This causes large numbers of terrible deaths. We will instead arrest that leader. Our would-be emperors can instead live together in one prison. Of the seven billion of us today, only a handful are dreaming of world conquest through war. We, the human beings of the world, tell our leaders that we will no longer conduct their wars. We will not let a handful of leaders start war and kill millions of persons this century. We now choose to glorify nurturing and kindness, not war, violence, and profit. Rather than just outlawing guns for the public, let's follow the Dalai Lama's advice and take guns away from every army. In fact, let's remove every army from our planet. Our most selfish leaders will then be less deadly. What purpose do guns and armies serve today? Mostly they prolong injustice. As the first group of 100,000 of us head to live on Mars, will we have to take armies, guns, and bombs with us? For what purpose? To protect us from aliens or from the conquest-minded leaders? Of the trillion dollars spent on tanks, planes, and ships throughout World War II, 10% of this money was the business profits that went to a few hundred persons who owned most of the stock of a few dozen war companies. Despite Eisenhower's warning, U.S. military spending has increased such that it now spends as much as does the rest of the world combined. Through the last 50 years, the U.S. military has conducted actions in 50 of the 200 nations of the world. No other country does this. U.S. politicians constantly state that they should choose the leaders of other nations. This makes people mad at the U.S. While campaigning for president in the year 2000, George W. Bush said that foreign policy is easy. Just stop doing things that make other nations mad at us. A few years later, he said that great nations go to war. With the trillion dollars spent on the Iraq war, the U.S. could have instead funded complete health care and education for all 80 million of its citizens under the age of 21, spending $12,000 for each of them. The people of the U.S. do not have affordable health care or college. Instead, our leaders choose to spend our mutual money on a really big military force. In 2015, U.S. military spending was $0.6 trillion, which is the same money that all 50 states spend on K-12 education for 50 million students attending 100,000 public K-12 schools. The leading cause of suicide among combat veterans is guilt from having injured or killed another human being. The emperor does not care about soldiers, victims, guilt, or the misery of others. To avoid wiping out their own species, two members of a species do not normally fight to the death. If each encounter resulted in the death of one out of two participants, then there would soon be none. One day, if a group of 100 members paired up and fought to the death, then only 50 would be left alive. After the next day's fight, there would be only 25, then 12, 6, 3, and 1. In one week, the species would have murdered itself. Any species that does fight to the death will soon be gone. DNA knows not to fight to the death. People don't normally fight to the death either. In fact, they can't, because people have no lethal canines, claws, or horns. The lack of lethal anatomy shows that, for millions of years, we have not been fighting to the death. Killing with bare hands is a rare thing. A weapon must be used. In the U.S. today, two-thirds of murders are committed using a gun. In most of the world, one person in 100,000 commits murder. But in our most unjust cities, the number can be one in 10,000. If eight billion persons paired up one day and fought to the death, then four billion persons would be left alive. The next day, if those persons paired up and fought to the death, then there will be two billion left alive. After pairing up for just 33 days in a row, there would be just one person left alive. 
because 2 raised to the 33rd power is about 10 billion. Our DNA knows not to fight to the death. Gatherer hunters were marrying their neighbors, not murdering them. Gatherer hunters don't conduct war in which an entire group is murdered because soon there would be no groups left. Only emperors wipe out the residents of entire cities. Gatherer hunters have few possessions, so there are no spoils of war to be taken. The goal of a war party might be just to make scary sounds outside another village all through the night. If caught, sometimes a kidnapping or murder would be committed. If human beings were murderous by nature, then we would have wiped out our own species long ago. Only a tiny portion of us have so little empathy that we can harm another person. It is not okay for the good guys to commit murder. What did Sargon's invention do? Throughout the 2500 years following Sargon's empire, the amount of irrigated farmland decreased, wars disrupted society and impeded the repair of the canals. A dark age occurred from 1600 BC to 1300 BC in which trade nearly disappeared and people once again grew their own food. As local empires and self-seeking leaders constrained some regions of the world, other regions advanced civilization. Soon, 100% of us will be contributing to our mutual progress. In the ancient world, Royal women were sometimes used as pawns to cement relations through international marriages. For example, the widow of Tutankhamun asked the Hittite king to send a royal prince to serve as a king of Egypt, but the prince was murdered before he arrived. The Assyrian Empire attempted to squash a rebellion in Israel by forcibly moving the rebels to Assyria and keeping them there for a few generations. This resulted in the lost tribes of Israel. More recently, Stalin used this approach to move Chechnyans away from their homeland for a few generations. And China used the reverse technique in moving millions of people from China into Tibet to outnumber their original people. The city was synonymous with its deity which might also be given nurturing and parental characteristic as it was believed to protect the city. With the development of hierarchies of managers, people began arranging their collection of deities into a hierarchy. Since there are leaders of people, one particular god might be given the additional aspect of serving as a leader of all gods. The concept of leadership itself can be represented by a deity. Soon, the nearby Hebrews would develop the idea of a single God who, all at once, is the leader of people, represents leadership, is a protecting and nurturing parent, and is the power of everything. Each city built a temple to serve as the home for its God. City residents believed that the deity would naturally live in its home, thus ensuring the beneficial presence of that deity. People felt that there was a mutually beneficial relationship between themselves and the god of their city. They worshipped the god in return for its protection. The god needed the people's worship and punished them if they failed to do so. In later Mesopotamia, each individual came to have a personal protector god that was handed down from parent to offspring. They would say, The god of my fathers. When the city of Babylon came to control much of Mesopotamia around 1800 BC, it meant that Babylon's god Marduk had demonstrated that he was more powerful than the deities of the other cities. Similarly, the decline of a city was viewed as the abandonment of the city by its deity. An invading army would carry off the conquered city's divine statue to weaken the power of that city. Conquerors might choose to level a city so that its region would be left without its source of power, the city itself. As its former residents moved off to another location, the city was without power, the deity was no more, and its god was no more. 
Each city also retained its local pantheon from prehistoric times, but all Mesopotamian gods were now thought to dwell in the various city temples instead of being in their formerly sacred streams, trees, or mountains, as occurs in most every culture. When Mesopotamian religious leaders promoted crop fertility, they went to the temple, not to the crop field. This was in contrast to what had been done through previous centuries and in other places around the world. For example, before Mayans planted corn in a field, they built an altar there and then said a prayer. They believed that the corn god received nourishment from the prayer and the ritual and rewarded the Mayans with corn. It was a reciprocal arrangement between the Mayan and the god. The Hopi people of the deserts of the southwest believe that crops want to grow and are happy only when they are growing, but they are unable to grow unless people perform the right rituals. It is the role and the duty of people to perform the rituals so that corn can grow. Already by 3500 BC in Mesopotamia, temples were 30 by 80 meters or yards in size and were placed on hilltops for increased effect. Typically, each person in the city worked for a few months per year to build religious temples. After finishing the construction, everyone in the community stood back and admired the results of their mutual efforts. The redistribution of the surplus is controlled by temple priests who form the upper class and take hold of city administration. They justified their leadership through religion. The earliest cults were based on fertility and the priest's duty was to guarantee fertility by performing the correct rites. Writing and arithmetic were developed in the religious temple and in the governmental palace, and they were used to count quantities and to record contracts and payments. As people delivered crops or animals, a record keeper or scribe had to count them and make a note of who had delivered them. This means that for the last 5,000 years, a common conversation in any office has been, who brought in those four items yesterday? Nobody wrote it down. Still today, you write words and add numbers for much the same reasons as required the invention of these tools. For example, to make grocery lists and to balance your bank account. When trying to count dozens or hundreds of animals, it is easy to lose track midway and have to start over. We do better if we instead drop a rock after counting each group of 10 animals and when finished enumerating the herd, count how many rocks have been dropped. In Mesopotamia, stones such as these began to be used around 9000 BC. Different shapes of clay were used to indicate different types and numbers of animals. Soon, people began to instead draw pictures of animals and mark numerical symbols onto soft pieces of clay tablet. The figures were drawn using a sharp object that scraped lines into the soft clay. It took some time and effort to scrape out sections of clay. The first form of writing used pictographs, which are picture symbols that portray meaning. Can you think of a small picture that can represent the idea paid, 100 due, or the king is great. Forms of writing that use picture symbols can often be read by people everywhere. For example, if the word dog is represented by a picture of a dog, then everyone can read this symbol no matter which language they speak. Still today, Chinese writing uses symbols developed 2,500 years ago that are as much art as they are symbols. The spoken language has changed since then, but since many written symbols have not, people today can still read ancient Chinese documents. An early improvement in Mesopotamian writing was to press wedge-shaped marks into the clay rather than having to gouge lines onto the clay. That is, a pressing motion rather than a scraping motion made the process of writing much faster. Our oldest writing systems employed a unique symbol for each word, resulting in thousands of symbols, such as occurs on Kanzi's lexigram board. 
The oldest form of writing were so difficult to use that it took students many years to learn. A few centuries later, a different symbol was instead used only for each syllable. For example, one might represent the word Nielsen with Neil plus Sun. Using the sound of sun in many words reduces the number of symbols needed in a system of writing. The fewest number of symbols occurred as we learned to represent each spoken sound by a single character. Less than 50 symbols are needed in these systems that appeared around 1000 BC. When archaeologists discover an ancient, previously unknown form of writing, they simply count the number of different symbols to quickly classify the type of writing system. Scholars reconstruct the evolution of writing systems in each region of the world. Each state adopts and improves the system obtained from a predecessor, beginning with Akkadian cuneiform and the heretic or cursive version of ancient Egyptian writing, which was altered in the Sinai Peninsula, and then by the Phoenicians. Whenever we speak, we use our lips and tongue to alter puffs of air into the alternating series of consonants then vowels that comprise the words of a thought. The oldest alphabet, which is the Phoenician alphabet, has symbols for consonants but not for the vowels between the consonants. This alphabet became widely used in business throughout the Middle East and Mediterranean. Aramaic, which was spoken by Jesus, uses 22 symbols in its alphabet, which is a derivative of the Phoenician alphabet and a precursor to the Arabic and to the Hebrew alphabets. The Phoenician alphabet modified older symbols from ancient Egyptian writing and its proto-Semitic grip. For example, Alpu was the word for ox in ancient Egypt. The two horns are still seen in the Phoenician symbol. The ancient Greeks eventually adopted and modified the Phoenician alphabet. The Alpu symbol became Alpha, drawn with two curly ox horns. The Greeks put the alphabet into its Finnish form of consonants and vowels. The Alpha became the Latin A. Several Latin letters can be traced back to Egyptian hieroglyphs. The Egyptian hieroglyph Betu, or house, became the Greek Beta and the Latin B. The Egyptian hieroglyph Gamlu, or throw, became the Greek Gamma and the Latin G. The Egyptian hieroglyph Dag, or fish, became the Greek Delta and the Latin D. By the way, you might like to know that one ancient Greek was quoted to say that writing would mean the end of civilization because we would no longer have to memorize. There are similar histories for the writing systems of India, China, Southeastern Asia, and the Americas. We humans invented writing as a tool to solve certain problems. We then modified this invention through the next several centuries as we learn by trial and error how to make it simpler to learn and to use. Writing, as for any other part of our civilization, was not a gift from the gods but was invented by us human beings for our own use. Each generation inherits all the tools and procedures that the previous generations have produced and then makes them even better. Right now you are reading the current form of our system of writing. This connects you to the humans of the first cities, as do the roads and buildings that you use and the food that you eat. For some persons, writing seemed like magic in that it could be seen to actually represent the object that was written about, in the same way that artworks could be seen to represent the essence of the depicted object. Literate craftspersons might write the name of a deity on a plaque, which they then sold to an illiterate customer. Imagine that you could purchase such a plaque to hang in your home. You would then have the continued presence of that deity looking over your home. If your name was written on a plaque, your name would last forever. Throughout history, many kings and queens have boasted wildly about their power, feats, and accomplishments as if they had only to be written down to be believed. Today, it is the advertisers and campaigners who think that it has only to be written down in order for it to be believed. 
Literacy was as highly a respected skill then as it is today. In fact, it is still used as a measure of the social progress of a nation. Many ancient kings and queens boasted that they could read and write, but the literacy rate of the general population was usually a few percent. Ancient Athens was a rare exception. During the 4th and 5th centuries B.C., about half of its male citizens were able to read and write. Such a high literacy level was not again reached until the last two centuries. Tablets were sometimes signed by being marked with a so-called cylinder seal, which has a unique design embossed onto its surface. To transfer that design onto a piece of soft clay, the cylinder seal would be pressed onto the tablet and then rolled through one complete revolution, producing the signature, much as we sign a document today. Notice that it would have been the job of certain persons to make these seals, while others made the material using clay tablets. Society invented the rules that required these signatures and the occupations needed for their creation and use. To learn to write, scribes began school at the age of four, five, or six. Most often, they were children of the highest officials, such as governors, temple administrators, army officers, tax officials, and priests. Some young children were sent to live with foreigners to become bilingual scribes. Students memorized ancient literacy work by reciting them aloud in outdoor classrooms that everyone in town could hear as they walked past. Scribes felt that they had the best jobs in the city because the scribe had the opportunity to advance through the hierarchy. The scribe of a food storage facility could become chief scribe and then progress through the junior judge, town ruler, district ruler, and then regional ruler. The city has a stratified and complex society, unlike that of any gather-hunter group, and not very different from our own today. Scribes learned arithmetic and geometry. They would calculate the amount of stone to be cut, the amount of earth to be removed, and the labor needed for a public works project. They handled business contracts, court decisions, and the written communications between royals and officials, along with hymns to the gods, prayers and laments, and spells and rituals. We see that the administrators of the city were collecting, counting, and redistributing a variety of items, and paying salaries in food and in material goods. Babylonian arithmetic used base 60. We continue using this today in our divisions of time and angles. Numbers in arithmetic seem like magic to some ancient persons and to some people today. For example, some people feel that the number 7 is lucky, but 13 is not. How about 7 times 13? Would that result be lucky or unlucky? We humans naturally count only in terms of one, two, three, and many, and research shows that some other animals do the same. Before the surplus of the farming villages, we had no reason to count much higher than the number of persons in our band. We then invented arithmetic so that we could count sheep, baskets of grain, and buckets of earth and such. This arithmetic built ancient cities and their buildings. Some people wondered what sort of things could be done with their new numbers and tried to find new ways of combining them into fractions, for example. We continue to this day to expand the fields of mathematics. As our civilization has become more complex, we require increasingly complex mathematics. We use calculus, differential equations, and computer techniques and such to build our modern civilization. As you approached an ancient Mesopotamian city, you would encounter cultivated fields and the villages of the farmers, and then gardens, date palm orchards, and large but distant temples and palaces. 
The city consisted of citizens, bureaucrats, entrepreneurs, temple priests, and the king and queen in their palace. Different city sections were used to produce and sell each of pottery, clay figures, stone amulets, jewels, and cylinder seals and such. The tanning area was easily identified by its smell and was located away from the living quarters. Homes had stone walls, small rooms, no windows, and were often built around a central courtyard. People slept on the roof when the weather was suitable. In the earliest villages, an extended family lived together and acted as a single economic unit, just as did the previous gather-hunter bands. The sale of land required the approval of every family member. As villages grew into cities, nuclear families instead began to pursue individual economies, just as we do today. As cities grew, tribal membership became forgotten also. Childhood was short before work began. Girls were married around age 12 to an older man of their family's choosing. Arranged marriages are always done to create a bond between a pair of extended families. Divorced, abandoned, or widowed women could next marry whomever they wanted. Women usually had two or three children and would breastfeed each child for three years. Women wove owned taverns, lent money, were priestesses, bought and sold land, made legal contracts and claims, and went to court. In later Greece and Rome, they could not. The government had a propaganda concern for widows and orphans, but no aid system existed. People were buried either underneath their homes or in a cemetery, and the inheritance was divided between all the male and some of the female children. Land was cheap because so much was available. Its price remained stable for many centuries. Typically, one hectare or half acre sold for the price of one cow. A wide variety of food was farmed or gathered. Cattle, sheep, and goats were raised for their milk, wool, and hair, but not for their meat. The domesticated pig was eaten until a later religious taboo forbid the practice. The city was filled with the exchanges of goods between farmers, fishers, herders, and shopkeepers. Barley and wheat formed a major part of the family's daily meal. They bought grain at a local shop and then ground it with pestle and mortar. Each family spent hours every day laboriously grinding enough grain to produce ten liters or quarts of flour and then baking it into bread. Bread was baked into unleavened loaves using clay ovens. They also made fancier breads and cakes having dates and such added. When archaeologists excavate such an ancient loaf, they find that it tastes just like my sister's apple pie. Barley flour or dates was made into beer by brewers able to carefully control the temperature and humidity throughout the process. Most brewers were women, as was their deity Nenkisi, until men took over the process around 1500 B.C. In every city throughout history, processed beer and wine have always been safer to drink than water, and so more commonly consumed. Household water was carried from wells or canals that were a ten-minute walk from the home. Some homes had interior, private wells. It took no extra thought to bring water into the city because they were already building canals to bring water from rivers to farmlands. Grain was planted, irrigated, harvested, threshed, winnowed, sieved, and stored. In each city, a large portion of farmland was owned by either the palace or the temple. Urban residents often owned farmland too, but might contract tenants to work the land. The tenant, who received more than half the harvest, and the landowner each took their share the moment the entire crop was placed onto the threshing floor. Threshing floors were owned by the largest organizations, who charged a fee for their use. The grain was then transported to the city storage silos using chariots or pack animals, but most was taken by canal and boats. Canals connected farmlands directly to the city and led right to the doors of the palace and temple silos. 
A typical grain silo would be 8 by 4 meters and could feed 20,000 persons for 6 months. The silo was lined with two layers of bricks to protect the enclosed grain from moisture, insects, and rodents. The silo doors had no locks. Instead, a clay band was pressed with a cylinder seal. The storage official was the only person who was allowed to break the seal and open the door. Temple and palace workers were given a monthly ration of grain. Each man received 60 liters or quarts per month. Each woman received 30, and some older persons may have received a ration without having to work. Workers were also given rations of wool and other goods, some of which were bartered at the market for other items. Temples and palaces were the largest landholders. Some of the temple's land was farmed by its own staff, while other plots were lent as payment to workers, and the remainder rented to others. Some persons performed their labor tax in the great temple households. Craft specialists worked with pottery, reeds, wool, leather, stone, metal, felt, or jewelry, and made cloth, clothing, boats, utensils, engravings, perfume, and glass and such. Children either learned the specialty of their parents or became apprentices in which they learned a craft by trading their labor for lessons from an expert. An apprentice weaver would be trained for five years, cooks for 16 months, but bleachers, carpenters, sill engravers, leather workers, shoemakers, and builders were each trained for eight years. Documents show that trainees were legally bound to their trainer. This sort of contract between trainer and trainee remained the same until after the origin of the factory in the year 1760 A.D. A group of craft workers could hire out to any institution but would sometimes sign a contract to work for just one institution for a certain period of time. Craftspeople would be paid the standard legal ration of food. Legal codes sometimes regulated the fees paid to specific craft workers and also the wages paid to forced laborers, but other workers, such as those in the agricultural fields, were usually hired for an agreed-upon wage. If the king and queen wanted a new chariot, then all the required craft workers would work together in one shop, combining wood, leather, felt, metal parts, and inlaid semi-precious stones to build the chariot. A contractor might be paid a one-time upfront lump sum to dig canals and hope to obtain a profit. The wool industry involved many persons and enormous numbers of sheep and goats. The animals were brought once a year into the village for shearing. This filled the streets with sheep. Wool was stored until it could be washed, combed, spun, and then woven into cloth. These steps remain the same today, except they were combined into a single water-powered factory during the Industrial Revolution around the year 1760 A.D. There were 13,000 weavers in the city of Ur by the year 2200 B.C. Each woman would weave about 30 centimeters or 12 inches of cloth per day and was paid in food and cloth rations. The palace and the temple were the largest consumers of finished cloth because they used them as wages to pay their enormous staff. The wool, leather, reed, and clay industries involved rural producers, village processors, and urban consumers. In contrast, the hardwood, stone, ore, gold, silver, and gem industries involved trade with foreign sources for materials processed with local labor. Thousands of clay tablets record loan contracts between individuals, groups of persons, or institutions. Gold, silver, or crop were loaned for a period of days or sometimes years. Interest was not always charged. Some legal codes prescribed a 20% interest rate for silver and 33% for grain. In one transaction, 14 persons loaned 15 kilograms or 7 pounds of gold to one person, who then bought tin and textiles to take to Anatolia, 
which is in modern Turkey. The borrower kept one-third, while the loaners each made one-third on their investments. A person could receive a loan in return for working for the loaner for a period of ten years. At the end of this time, the borrower might take a spouse from the loaner's household and once again be a free person, as happened to the biblical Jacob. When farmers bought land, they might contract to pay a price of one cow per hectare after the first harvest was sold. Farmers contracted with produce merchants who would retail a farmer's newly harvested crops, but the merchants didn't pay the farmer until after the crop was sold to the customer. A farmer's loan was due at harvest time. To guarantee the loan, the farmer might pledge the use of a tool or boat or the labor of a spouse or child for a specified period of time. Today we wonder who was the first person greedy enough to require that a loan be guaranteed with a child's labor. Farmers sometimes paid so much interest that they could not pay taxes. The king and queen might then cancel the farmer's outstanding debts to free up tax money, but didn't have the ability to correct permanently the injustice of the system. Around 2000 BC, palaces, temples, and urban landowners began selling to entrepreneurs the rights to collect and market the harvest from their land holdings. Before harvest, the entrepreneur paid one-third of the crop's estimated value paid another third after selling the produce, and hoped to have the remaining third as profit. Since grain, fish, and milk have short shelf lives, the palace and temple wanted instead to have easily storable silver and let the entrepreneur worry about collecting, preserving, storing, and selling the perishable crops. Sheep, oxen, cows, donkeys and pigs were each managed through contracts in which the palace or temple would consign animals to a herder who kept 20 percent of the newborns as payment of wages. The contract specified the division of milk, wool, and hides between the herder and the temple or palace, and it specified the percentage of newborn male animals to be eaten and the percentage of newborn female animals that would be allowed to mature and bear further generations. Mesopotamia exported grain and wool and imported honey, raisins, bitumes, precious metals, gypsum for constructing buildings and boats, and resin and spices from Iran and Syria, cedarwood from Lebanon, gold from southern Egypt, stone from Turkey, blue lapis lazuli stone from Afghanistan, and various goods from India. By 2000 BC, there was plenty of trade among these distant regions. Trade moved mainly by water until the domestication of camels in the 12th century BC. One merchant took Mesopotamian textiles to the Hittite kingdom in Turkey and exchanged them for tin. The merchant made this two-month journey on many occasions sometimes making a hundred percent profit and sometimes losing everything. Prices were usually given in terms of weights of grain or silver, but any sort of goods might be exchanged in the bartering process. Since silver had to be weighed during each transaction, cities eventually began to make pre-weighed coins in standardized sizes to speed up transactions. Cities eventually began to make pre-weighed coins in standardized sizes to speed up transactions. These first coins were made in Lydia around 640 BC. Forgeries quickly followed, but cities continued to mint coins because of the prestige it brought. The Arabian Kingdom of Saba, which is Sheba in the Bible, exported frankincense and myrrh as far north as Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean. To protect their monopoly of these products, they spread rumors that the sources were guarded by monsters and flying serpents. Other than sometimes forcing people to kill and be killed, emperors mostly left their followers alone. Royal power had become absolute, but did not interfere with the people's daily lives. For example, citizens could freely congregate and debate. The king and queen held political power, 
sometimes shared with a council and assembly of sorts, and they tried to satisfy the needs of the people and concerns of the gods. Since everyone knew that farming formed the basis and enabled the existence of the city, city rulers always write about their desire to irrigate and cultivate as much land as possible and to open up new land to agriculture. The city ruler was the head of the redistribution system. Around 2500 BC, a text from the city governor of Largus Gursu promised to alleviate oppressive taxation and extensive government supervision and to return the fields that his predecessor had taken from the temple. This was more a promise to the gods than to the people and reveals that government burdens had already increased to unwelcome levels, that the government thought it was okay to tinker with the economy and that tinkering was an old practice. Often, a people view their relation with their king and queen as that between a caring parent and children or between a shepherd and a flock of sheep. The king and queen had to ensure that the people were fed and that they were protected from enemies. The king and queen knew that their subjects expected them to deal with every crisis. The king led in war, guaranteed the fertility of the land by digging and maintaining canals, provided justice in disputes, and averted divine wrath against the people by promoting the religious cult. Kings and queens acknowledged the influence of the gods who had selected them for their leadership. They made decisions about general policies, security, the cult, and agricultural conditions, but never considered the opinions of the citizens. They were the head of the palace organization which might incorporate a large portion of the city's population. In this role, they were like the head of a large household in that, when needed, they would even take care of petty matters occurring in the lives of their dependents. The palace was a major landholder, owned large herds, and consumed and produced much to feed, clothe, and equip its large staff. Many scribes conducted a careful accounting of all that was involved. For every aspect of palace operation, they knew how much there was and how much would be needed. A governmental palace might have as many as 75,000 sheep. Some of these animals were eaten by the king and queen and the staff and their families, but most were used to produce wool for sale. The palace staff processed the animal products from its own herd into the leather items and such that were needed in daily operations. The palace purchased other raw materials for its staff to process. To obtain these specific materials and supplies, the palace contracted with agents who would twice a year be sent with cartloads of silver, grain, and wool to buy them from sources at home and abroad. Ever since the first redistributional chiefdoms, city leaders have collected taxes from the residents. Taxes might be paid in grain, animals, or labor. Typically, each person gave one week's labor per month working the palace or temple crop fields or helping to build large public works such as canals, religious temples, and governmental palaces. The Egyptian pyramids were built this way. People built their city with their own hands. When needed, the government might hire additional persons and pay them in grain or silver but every worker was fed the legal ration of about 3,000 calories per day while on the job. Such a labor tax was used by every state throughout the world to build large structures. Governmental administrators also monitored the herd levels of the residents and collected a portion of each herd in taxes. Those of us who have no empathy for others can enslave human beings. Slaves were not common because they were too expensive, costing as much as 10 hectares or 5 acres of land. One document tells of slaves sold in 2430 BC. Slaves were foreigners who had been captured in war, mainly from the Northeast, and were allowed to marry and to have families. 
They were mostly used for household labor because it was too difficult to supervise slaves in the fields. To combat defections, those of us who were slaves had to wear identifying metal armbands and were given a haircut in the style of a knob of top hair. One king might give another the names of escaped slaves, asking him to watch out for them. The people of the city's bureaucracy carried many titles, including mayor, chair of the assembly, overseer of the merchants, governor, bailiff, barbers, overseers of the barbers, gatekeeper, doorkeeper, and the one who hires contracts for harvest labor. There were also weavers, launderers, butchers, sun-dried brick makers, ferry operators, gardeners, and orchard tenders. These titles give us a glimpse into the occupations and operation of the cities. Which of these jobs would you prefer? One king reminded a mayor of his duty to keep the city free of robbery, murder, and foreign invaders seeking plunder. The mayor was also responsible for the territory surrounding the city and for any fortified settlement in the countryside. If a robbery or murder occurred, then the mayor would be fined. Another mayor was caught keeping some of the collected taxes instead of sending it on to the higher central authority. Much effort was spent in the palace attempting to predict the future. A network of scouts were posted throughout Mesopotamia to watch for omens that might help the royal court predict the future. If a scout learned of the birth of a two-headed goat, then a report would be sent to the court for interpretation. Mesopotamians began to record the positions of the moon and planet, along with observations of the weather and the level of the Euphrates River and such. Each city and each district within each city had its own court, and everyone received a trial by a jury of their peers. In cases involving persons from two different cities, each person brought judges from their own city. The court saw fewer criminal cases than civil cases which usually involved property disputes or divorces. Many smaller problems were handled in a personal manner by the neighborhood's family heads, as had been done since the first bands of gatherer hunters. No city had a sizable police force until the Industrial Revolution funded them and caused their need during the 19th century A.D. The courts were called assemblies, but it isn't clear if every citizen could speak in the assembly. An assembly would sometimes be a meeting of citizens discussing many topics, including lawsuits and town business. Does your neighborhood have such meetings? The occupations of each assembly speaker was recorded in the tables and typically included gardeners, bird catchers, potters, commoners, and soldiers and such. This shows that a wide range of persons had the right and the time to attend the assembly. It isn't known if the assembly consisted of open debate or if participation was meant to bring public prominence. The assembly may have remained from earlier tribal or village days, we saw that the Canela had such an assembly. The basic goal of the court was to obtain a settlement satisfying both parties and to allow each party to relieve their minds by saying what they came to say. At the end of the discussion, both parties had to swear to having been satisfied.
The court procedure consisted of examining documents and hearing statements made by both sides and by many witnesses. Before making a statement, each person took an oath by the gods. A conflict of statements might be resolved by ordeal. It was hoped that the fear of certain death during an ordeal would cause people to tell the truth. Notice that bands and chieftains did not have the authority to order and conduct an ordeal. We'll see that the ordeal was ridiculed out of use during the Middle Ages. Legal documents show that prisons did not exist and that penalties were usually paid in monetary form, but sometimes in labor. For example, two persons who were found to have stolen two ducks from outside a temple were each required to repay 30 ducks. Hammurabi's legal code appeared around 1750 BC and is typical of many others throughout the world. It contains specific penalties such as property offenses or the number of years that a debtor would serve in the home of a loner. It also had descriptions of land tenure, trade agreements, adultery, marriage rules, divorce rules, adoption, inheritance, wages for services, slavery, planting or flooding another's field, and the failure to cultivate or to harvest a leased field. The city and civilization came about because a room filled with grain can feed thousands of persons for months. We invented civilization to coordinate groups of persons larger than our innate band of 50 or so persons. The first cities had to invent everything that a city is and solve every problem that came up, usually after some fumbling around in the dark. But notice that we never solve a problem before it occurs. We see that the Mesopotamian city-state and its many levels and occupations was a more complex structure than that of a group of gatherer hunters and that it was about as complex as your own today. With their big buildings, tangled systems, and fast pace, every big city on the planet looks much the same and looks much like the cities of ancient Mesopotamia. The gatherer hunter and canela ways of life may seem strange to you, but you are familiar with the way of life of the world's first city dwellers.